You asked me a question. I would like to answer it. Tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of the day 50 Evergreen students, students that I had never met, disrupted my class, accusing me of racism and demanding my resignation. But if, if you would allow me to, I, I feel that there's In a, a safe space, could you say this sentence? Could you say, Donald Trump is president of the United States? Could you say that in a safe space on college campuses today? Hi, my name is Tony DiGirolamo. I'm a writer. I've written for The Simpsons comics. I've written over 60 issues of that. Uh, I wrote for Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher. I've written a lot of comedy. I've written a lot of games and comics and cool stuff over the years. And uh, this time I am writing a political satire with my friend Christian. I think the reason we picked a novel for this story and not comic book like we've always done is uh it's very topical comic books it's it's tough to be topical and it's a it's a very complex story it would have required a ton of pages uh, a lot of times there's uh, subtext in a novel that in a graphic novel it's a lot harder to portray um and in a movie you really need top-notch actors to portray you know, very subtle subtext. So the novel really for us is a, is a sort of a classic way. And when you're talking about politics, really it's something that needs to be read because people need to think about politics and what it's doing to their minds and what it's doing to their, you know, where they live. Uh, a lot of it was inspired by the Evergreen College situation, uh, the Gibson Bakery uh, protests and subsequent lawsuit, the Antifa riots, especially in Portland, and a lot of the videos that I saw about these things. So if you watch the videos from Evergreen, you can see the students meet with the dean, and that was one of the scenes in the book. Um, you know, it was just an absolute disaster for the dean because he didn't seem you know, an evergreen to understand exactly what he was confronting. He wasn't just confronting a bunch of students with some problems and that they were reasonable. He was confronting essentially zealots who were protecting their dogma. So that's what we do in uh, Wokistan. And actually we take it a step further. They're not just protecting their dogma. It's part of their plan to unravel the college further and completely undermine the dean. They've, they've lured him into a trap in this meeting, and uh, Mundell knows that and tries to help him, but the dean is too arrogant and realizes too late what he's fallen into. So, for instance, there's this video of uh, Antifa redirecting traffic in Portland and just yelling at people trying to drive down the street and for seemingly no reason. So we, you know, that's when the, when the students take over the school, the Antifa guys are the sort of muscle and they're, you know, at the gates of the school, letting people in or telling them to get lost. And, uh, you know, as we say in the blurb of the book, anyone to the right of Fidel Castro is a fascist and that's the problem. So, you know, it's not the, no one wants fascism other than the fascist, but, uh, you know, Antifa's tactics are very similar to the fascists. They're violent, um, they're, they're dogmatic, and um, they wear a uniform, all black, they cover their faces. All the elements that created Trump's opportunity are not only still here, but they're much worse. So, this isn't in, in the book, but it very well could have been uh, Donald Trump Jr. going on The View, which just happened a couple of days ago. You see the media elites, in this case, the ladies on The View, they're so arrogant and so full of hypocrisy that they can't even say Donald Trump's name in the in an, it was essentially just a TV show interview with a guy promoting a book. It happens every day. And rather than just do it, they have to look 
self-righteous and virtue signal to their audience that, you know, they hate him, they hate Donald Trump, and they hate everything he stands for, and it's, it's just gone too far. Like, you hate him so much, but you still had him on the show. Um, you know, if you're going to have him on the show, say his name. And if you're going to have a reasonable conversation, have one if you're supposedly real. So Donald Trump Jr. Uh, called them out on some of their foibles and uh, they didn't really have an answer. They just kind of denied them, right? So he called Joy Behar out on uh, wearing blackface and to which their response was, well, it wasn't blackface. Um, and now it's all over the internet, which Donald Trump Jr. absolutely knew that was gonna happen. So it shows you how the ladies of the view, they don't understand how media works anymore. They were just acting like these high and mighty women who, oh, on the one hand, they, they started with, oh, we like to have open views on everybody. But then, you know, a guy comes out with totally different views and they just won't let him speak. They yell at him, uh, they lie to him, they lie about him and, uh, it makes Trump Jr. look like the victim. And he is, he was victimized by the ladies of The View. And all he had to do is sit there and be reasonable. And he totally was reasonable. And this is what Donald Trump done, has done through most of his campaign, uh, now that the media elites cannot tolerate him. So they make, out, make up outrageous lies in hopes of derailing his campaign, derailing his presidency. And then when these lies blow up in their face, Rather than say, well, that was wrong or whatever, or giving Trump any amount of credit, they just move on to the next lie. And they're, they're ruining their own credibility and all Trump has to do is be reasonable. He doesn't have to be competent. He doesn't have to be good. He just has to be reasonable. He just has to face them with logic and facts. And he's running circles around them. So 2020 is gonna be a re-election landslide you know, they haven't, the Democratic Party is just like the ladies on The View. They think they they not only should be in control, they are better people. And that is why they're willing to call people deplorables, that they're willing to snub their nose at people. And um, it makes Trump, and they have rehabilitated the credibility of the Republican Party. It was in the toilet before this election. Now it's, it's through the roof. You're going to have uh, another four years of Trump. Uh, nothing has changed. And Trump, at the very least, and you have to give him credit, he has brought the economy back. It's roaring ahead and people are making money and they have jobs and unemployment's down. So, you know, rather than say, well, maybe some of this is working and we have to adjust, they're just like, no, everything's bad. And we're going to undo everything. And we're going to do things completely different. No one wants that. Moderates definitely do not want that. They want... They want you to take, pick and choose the good policies of Donald Trump and then add some of your own. But if you can't do that, if everything he does is toxic and you know racist and bigoted, then you know no one's gonna vote for you. It's too extreme. We didn't take it to a mainstream publisher because no mainstream publisher would publish this. Not right now. You know, I'm trying to get reviews for Wokistan you know, and it's a little harsh. It's a harsh, but you know, political satire or any satire has to be harsh. Um, they don't want to review it. They don't want to read it because they're going to go, wow, that was hard to read. They don't want to read hard things. They, like most people, men or women, they want to read things that validate their opinion, that validate their life. And they want to read about how they can tell their daddy that they knew better. So, Wokistan says mostly to women because understanding that leftist ideology tends to skew female, that it's gone too far. You know, we have in the book uh, a lot of the fe male to female relationships fail because it is mostly the women embracing this limitless potential that they just don't see any reason to compromise. And so you have this uncompromising vision on the one hand for women, and then you have men trying to just be sort of like pragmatic. And that's what's kind of driving these relationships to break apart. Because if you are a person who has 
no consequences to your life and no consequences to breaking up or, you know, leaving your husband or whatever, why wouldn't you leave him if something better comes along? What does love matter? Because, you know, eventually you're with somebody long enough, you're at some point going to be mad at them or annoyed with them. And, and, you know, if you could just leave whenever you want, then what is marriage? What is relationships? They're nothing. And that's kind of where women are now in terms of the relationship and in terms of feminism. It's like, girl, you can have everything and you can't. The most rewarding thing about writing Wokistan is having a project that really says something because I think a lot of times people write books and they have nothing to say. You know, I think we said a lot in Wokistan and that's why the book is sort of very tight and a lot of things happen and we have a million characters so you get to see a lot of different ideologies. So Wokistan is, uh, right now it's an ebook on Amazon. You can download it or you can uh, read it under uh, Kindle Unlimited users. They can read books for free. Uh, we're going to get a print book out. We're planning on an audio book. And then we're planning on sequels, uh, exploring how the wokeness infects other aspects of society, media, uh, government, uh, all kinds of things. So uh, we have at least two other installments planned, maybe more. We'll see how it goes.